One more time, without salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I've been trying over the past few days to finish by 9.30, but as I've looked over the times over the past few days, we seem to have run on a little bit. We seem to have gone over a little bit, a little bit more than 45 minutes. I'll try again today to keep my discussion short, but today what we're talking about, it's very important. There's a lot to it, and at the end of it, the Messiah is also very long. But we'll try our best, inshallah, within 45 minutes to cover what we can. <coughs> If we are able to, we will complete our discussion on loneliness today, or we'll get through as much of it as possible, and then tomorrow, inshallah, with whatever time we have remaining, tomorrow will be the last majlis, inshallah, we will look at anxiety. Inshallah, on the 10th Muharram, there will be English Masaib, the 11th Muharram, there won't be an English majlis, but on the 12th, inshallah, we'll have a small session where we can sit, talk, there will be questions, answers, and we can get to know each other a little bit. Inshallah, if you can plan a tent, it'll be a worthwhile session, it'll be something which often I find 
can be more helpful than the majalis themselves. For a lot of people, that one session on the 12th of Muharram, there'll be an Urdu one going on upstairs and an English one here as well. Often I find that that session can be one of the most useful days, one of the most useful sessions in the lecture series of Muharram Majalis. Besides Allah, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Yesterday, we were looking at the different types of isolation, the different types of loneliness. We looked at the different ways in which people feel lonely, and related to that, but different and also important, is what we look at today. The causes, the reasons people feel lonely, the reasons they might feel alone. Now, we mentioned the very first type of isolation yesterday, the very first type that we mentioned was individual isolation. Where somebody feels alone because they are alone. They feel alone because the people around them are far away from them. They feel alone because maybe they live alone, separate from the people they care about and the people that care about them. It's physical, because they are separate from the other people, from the people around them. And the first cause of loneliness that we look at relates to this. So we call individualism. Now, in what we call geographic psychology or global psychology, what we look at is how different people think, how different people's minds work around the world. So for instance, the way in which we growing up in the UK think might be different to the way in which people growing up in Spain might think, or the way in which people growing up in Germany might think or the way in which people growing up in Pakistan, or India, or Bangladesh might be. This global psychology looks at the different ways in which people think, the different ways in which their mind works. Now, one thing that this global psychology finds is that we, living in the Western world, so Europe, America, UK, I know UK is part of Europe, but you know, when we're in the country, we stress it a bit more, we focus on it a bit more. We living in the Western world, we tend to be more individualistic in comparison to those who live in the East. And I've tested this out as well. I've tried to see if this is true. See, where I live in Iran, I live in dormitories. But in the dormitory that I'm in, there's only international students. Students from Africa, students from Europe, students from Asia, students from all around the world, from little villages to big cities, I met people in those dormitories who've never heard of London. They've never heard of where London is. One person once asked me if England is in London. See, to us that might seem strange. They've never heard of London, one of the biggest cities in the world. But the way they think, the way they, they go about their lives, living in small villages, they've never heard of us. And so the way they act and the way their mind works is also different. So I tried it out, I tested it. I asked different people from different places some different questions, and I found that this was true. See, those who came from Europe, at the time there was nobody from America or from England, but those who came from Europe, they found themselves to be more individualistic. So what does that mean? They found that, or I found that, they prefer working alone. They prefer relying on themselves. They give more importance to what we call alone time. They were more individual. They spent more time, or they preferred to spend more time relying on themselves. So if they have a project, they'd rather focus on it themselves, get on with it themselves, as opposed to working in a group, working with other people, as opposed to taking help from others. They preferred to rely on their own ability. They preferred to rely on what they were good at. So for instance, if they have a project, if they have a task to complete, they would rather work on that project themselves. They would rather deal with the project themselves rather than go to somebody else, ask for their help, rather than work in a group. They felt more comfortable, more safe doing it themselves. And then on the other hand, the people who I asked questions from were from Asia, who are from Africa, guys from Azerbaijan, Nigeria, Turkey. I asked them, and for them, the majority, they found that, well I found that, they preferred to work in groups. 
they preferred to work with their community. They were more inclined, they liked better to do a group project together, and then whatever you get from the project, whatever reward you get from the project, to all read that reward together, to all get that reward together. Whereas the guys from Europe, they all prefer to do that project alone, work on it alone, and then at the end of it, they get the rewards alone. And we looked at struggling, going through a difficult time. And that's where it really becomes important, it's individualism. It was found that people who struggle in Europe, they prefer to struggle alone. They'd rather not talk about it, they'd rather not tell somebody else about their struggle. They'd rather not share their difficulties with other people. And there were a number of different reasons why they'd rather not. Some felt like they were burdening other people, like, this is my problem, so somebody else should have to deal with it. Other people felt like they didn't want other people to know. It was embarrassing for other people to know. This is my problem, so other people shouldn't know about it. Some people, they didn't want to share their problems or talk about their problems because they felt like, if this is my problem, then only I can help. That somebody else can't help. There were different reasons why they wanted to deal with their problems alone. But then when we looked at people from Asia, people from Africa, and I spoke to them, they found that it was better to deal with problems in a way that it was more communal. Often it wasn't through talking to other people, rather it was through helping other people with their problems, distracting themselves from their own problems. They would go and they would become more active in the community and work with other people to help them to solve their problems rather than deal with their own. They rather work together and bring themselves up together as opposed to work alone, as opposed to get through their problems and their struggles alone. This is one major cause of individualism, of isolation, is individualism, and it makes sense. We said one type of isolation is individual isolation, where we isolate ourselves, where we are isolated. So when our mindset, our preferences are all about ourselves, when our mindset and our preferences are based around isolation, working on just me, then it makes sense that I'll be distant from the people around me. It makes sense that I might struggle to make those connections and those bonds with the people around me. The second cause that we'll look at, the second cause for isolation, for loneliness, is delaying marriage. Now, it's one thing to rush into marriage, which we shouldn't do. But on the other hand, delaying marriage, What's the difference? See, delaying marriage is talking about once you're ready. Once you're ready to get married, and there's different things that we have to take into account when we talk about being ready to be married. Am I physically capable? Am I emotionally ready to get married? Am I ready to share my life with somebody else? Financially, am I able to support somebody else? Am I able to take care of somebody else? And importantly, do I have somebody to marry? Have I found someone who I'm comfortable spending my life with? Have I found someone who I'm ready to take that next step with? And as I say this, obviously, I'm not married, so this is purely direct. But everything we hear about marriage, through Islam, through today's sciences, the reason it's so important when it comes to isolation and loneliness is what does marriage do? It brings two people together. And what that does is it creates a connection, a relationship, an intimacy between the two of them. I can't remember quite whether I've already spoken about this or not. I know I was meant to speak about it in one of my previous lectures, but for some reason I was feeling like I missed the point, like I forgot to mention it. But I'll bring it up here again. It's one of the important cures, or rather, one of the important causes of isolation. Delaying your marriage. Once you're ready, not getting married. Pushing it further and further. Now, this relationship that it brings, this bond, it's the kind of bond that you don't get somewhere else. You can't get that bond with your friends. You have a bond with your friends and it's very strong. But it doesn't replace the bond you guys could have with a wife. With a partner. See, the relationship with your parents, it's very strong. It's irreplaceable. The strongest bond you'll have. But it's still, it's not a replacement for the relationship you have with a spouse, with somebody, with somebody you marry. 
relationship he has with brothers and sisters, again, I'll repeat the point again, but you get the point. Each and every one of these relationships is important. And we need to keep each of these relationships strong. We can't think that I have a good relationship with my parents, so I don't need to have a great relationship with my friends. I have a really good relationship with my brothers and sisters, so I don't need a relationship with a wife, with a spouse, with a partner. No. We need all of these relationships. They all serve different purposes. They all help us in different ways. This is the second cause of isolation, delaying marriage. And if you want to see how a marriage can help us, if you want to see how a spouse or a partner can help you when you're going through difficult times, when you're struggling with something, just look at what Imam Ali alayhi salam says. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said that when he would enter his house after a long day, full of worries and troubles and stress, he says as soon as he would see the face of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayhi he would forget all his troubles. He says he would forget all his troubles. Now, of course, in this is the great this is the great status of Sayyidah. But at the same time, it's the relationship that Imam Ali alayhi salam has with who? With his wife, with his partner. A relationship that you can't ignore. So of course, don't rush into marriage. Make sure you're ready. <coughs> in every different way, in every different department. Make sure you're ready. But at the same time, don't delay. Once you are ready, don't take longer than you need. Don't push it away. Don't put it off as something you'll think about in the future. This is the second cause of isolation. The third, technology. Now, technology is great. We've spoken about it before. And again, it's coming up today. So you said, before we said, there's no problem with having social media. I do. You do. We all do. We're all on social. We all have Twitter, we all have Instagram. Some of the older guys have Facebook. We all use this. But when we use it, we have to look at how it impacts us. See, it's great that because of WhatsApp, because of FaceTime, I can talk to my family in Pakistan. Okay, I don't very often, but. It's great that I can. It's amazing that anytime I want to, I can call someone who's halfway across the world. These few nights I've been staying in Salah. Does that mean I haven't been able to talk to my friends back in London? No. I can still talk to them every night, every day. Why? I've got my phone. I can call them. Well, I don't. I can text them. I do more. We text. I can snap them. I can message them, which is great. But, in the same way how we said, I have one relationship with my parents and one with my friends, for instance. My relationship with my parents isn't a substitute for my relationship with my friends. And my relationship with my friends isn't a substitute for my relationship with my parents. You can't have one or the other. See, a problem that a lot of us let happen, something that we have to take control of, us, but often we don't, is when this social interaction, which is great, that we do through our phones, becomes a substitute for actual real life interaction, for going out, for meeting people, for meeting our friends, spending time with them. See, the ability to talk to someone, to message someone's great, but it lacks something. It lacks what we call personability, because the person is not actually there. Albeit, everything I'm saying when I'm messaging, it could be genuine, come from my heart, it could be true whatever kind of conversation that might be. But, at the same time, there's still a lack of something there, that personal feeling. And of course, there's a lot of other feelings that we might feel, there's a lot of other things that we might feel, and it might get us even 90, 95% of the way. But the important bit is that last leap, that last step, which is personal interaction, actually being around someone, actually being with them. I'll give you an example. For the guy saying who's playing FIFA. When you play FIFA online against your mates, see you have fun, especially if you win. When you play FIFA with your mates and you're doing it in party mode so you can hear them talking, is it more fun or less fun? Do you enjoy yourself more when you can actually hear them or do you enjoy yourself less? For me, I enjoy myself more, generally because I'm winning. 
I enjoy hearing him loose. But what it does to me is it brings that little personal level. It brings that feeling that they're there. Even if I know on the other side of the screen, that's them. The guys running around in the athletic on the drip kit, that's them. That's my friend. But when I can actually hear his voice, it brings a more personal level to it, a more personal touch. Or another example, it's a similar one. Where, have you ever been sitting with somebody, maybe it's just the two of you, or you're sitting with a group of friends, and apart from yourself, everybody's on their phone. See, at that point, everybody's there. But they kind of feel like they're absent. They kind of feel like they're not quite there. In the same way, when you're on your phone, you're talking to somebody, and they're there, but at the same time, they're absent. At the same time, they're not quite there. They're a little bit distant from you, in one way or another. Why? Because that personal level isn't there. This is the third lack that we mentioned, cause of isolation. This lack of personal interaction, real life human interaction. <coughs> See, <coughs> playing FIFA is fun. But actually going out and play, playing football is more fun, for me at least. Why? Because I'm there, I'm with the guys. I know you feel emotion during FIFA. When you're playing FIFA, when it's tense, you feel that emotion. You feel that passion. But when you go out and you spend time with your friends, you actually enjoy yourself with your friends. Even, for instance, if you go to play football with your friends. When you're there, the feeling that you're, the thing that makes it enjoyable is different. So you could be losing. In FIFA, if you lose, you're not having fun. I can guarantee that. In football, although we don't like losing, we're competitive, I don't like losing. Any of you who've seen me play know that. See, in football, even if we lose, we might not be happy. We might not be smiling and laughing. We might be screaming and shouting at the ref. We might be screaming and shouting at our teammates. But what we're doing is still benefiting us. What we're doing is still helping us. Why? Because when we're out there together, when we're out there in front of one another, sitting with one another, standing with one another, running with one another, if you're sitting in a football game, then you deserve to get shouted at. But when we're out there with one another, really enjoying ourselves, or even if we're not enjoying ourselves, what it does is, is bring the connection between you guys closer together. It's bringing the connection and the bond between you closer, stronger. So for instance, and again, football, those of you, those of you who have been here from the start, you know that's what I refer to, that's where my examples come from. When Arsenal almost won the league, when Leicester took it instead. See, the reason Arsenal did well that season, or we could have done better, but the reason we did well, and this is one of the things I really noticed, I remembered, is that our entire team that season, whenever they would go out, go out to eat, go out to an arcade, go out to have fun, whatever it might be, whenever they'd go out, they used to go out together. Our team that season were real friends. They actually enjoyed being around each other. So then when they went onto the football pitch, they played better football. They worked better together. They had a better connection, a better understanding. Ozil knew exactly where to find Giroud. Fortunately, Giroud couldn't score very many goals that season, especially in the second half. I'll stop for a second, because whenever I mention Giroud, I get a little bit angry, I get a little bit annoyed. But, Rizal Allah, Salah Allah, Muhammad Allah, 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 It's okay, we have much better strikers now. Fair. When we look at the team then, what they did off the pitch and what they did on the pitch, it used to affect each other. They used to affect each other. Off the pitch, when they were interacting well, when they were spending time together, when they were enjoying themselves together, it built the connection that they had on the pitch. It built the closeness. For instance, if you look at the France team, which just won the World Cup, if you look at that team, that team has fun. They enjoy themselves together. And yeah, there's clips of them playing FIFA. There's clips of them, you know, sitting separately, messaging each other, whatever it might be. But they're still together. That season when Leicester won the league, what did they do? If you remember, Leicester didn't actually win the league while they were playing. 
they won the league because another team lost. I can't remember quite who it was, right? But what did they do? They all got together. I think it was Jamie Vardy's house. They all got together in his house and they all watched the match together. They could have all watched at home with their families and then messaged each other going, guys, we won the league. But is that the same? Does that have the same connection, the same emotion? No. See, when we spend time together, <coughs> it brings about a connection with us. It brings about a closeness between us. We said that being social is very important for dealing with the issue of depression. We said one of the great things that we have in Islam is the namaz jamaat, where we can pray together. Because what happens is that lack of distance, that closeness, it keeps us close together. Because we meet each other every day. We see each other every day. So it does have an effect. This is the third, technology. And again, I mention it. Technology is not a bad thing, but we have to keep control over it. We have to make sure that we have control over it. That we still spend time, sit down with your parents and talk to them, with your family, have a real conversation with them, rather than over text. In fact, literally just before this magic started, in South London, my sister had arrived outside the house to take my mum to the Imam Bar. So she messaged on the family group chat saying, can somebody tell mum I'm outside? And then my brother messaged on the group chat, mum, my sister's outside. <laughs> See, we have these kind of interactions. But when you sit together and you really talk, it makes a difference. It brings a closeness. This was the third cause of depression. The fourth that we'll look at, I'm bearing an eye on time, we'll go through it a little bit quickly, rejection. We all face rejection in life, setbacks. We all face rejection in different ways, in different forms. It could be a girl, a relationship, it could be a job, it could be a football team, it could be people asked for the team, picked, not, not picked at all. It could be all sorts of different things. But it's rejection that happens again and again, or when it happens even once, but very difficult, very hard. It can really hurt. It can really cause you damage. It can really cause you pain. I'll give you an example, and you can guess where the example is coming from. You can guess what it will be about. <laughs> See, I'm used to Arsenal losing. We do it a lot. It still hurts when we lose. But in Azerbaijan, in Baku, when we lost against Chelsea, for the life of me, I could not have imagined we were going to lose that match. Everything about the match, the history, the statistics, the players, everything pointed to Arsenal winning the match. And that loss hurt me more than all the losses of all the seasons put together. Why? Because I didn't expect it. I wasn't ready for it. I dealt with constant losses. But this one loss, it hurt me so much more. Why? Because A, it meant a lot to me. I've been waiting 13 years for Arsenal to get into another Euro European final. So I built it up. I was ready for it. It meant a lot to me. And in my head, if you ask my friends this, they will all tell you how confident I was that we would win that match. So when we didn't win that match, I cannot tell you how much that hurt. I can't even begin to explain. To give you an example, I went to Baku again. As in, I didn't get to go for the final. I had tickets, I didn't get to go. But I think about, it was two, maybe three months after the final, I went to Baku, separately, to see a friend. And as I drove past the stadium in the cab, I genuinely felt my heart hurt. Three months later, I'd just seen the stadium where the football match happened. See, I've dealt with Arsenal losing, but that one it had so much more of an effect. So when somebody deals with a rejection, it might be a job, it might be a relationship, it could be anything. But when they take it hard, when it hurts them, don't just assume that it shouldn't hurt them. Don't just assume that, you know, they need to man up. In fact, really worry, really wonder, what is it about that thing that affected them so much? Why did that hurt them so much? There might be something that they're thinking about, or a reason that it affected them so much more that you couldn't think of, that you didn't realize. But these rejections, they can hurt. And they come in many different ways, shapes, or forms. Some of you guys who have been job hunting, who have been job hunting, you'll know. Rejection after rejection. 
unfortunately, we have to inform you. You see that line? You see it again and again. Sometimes you won't even get a response. You apply for a job, you won't hear back. A lot of people, they give up after a while. They think, what's the point? Or for instance, university students, when you're looking for an internship, a placement, you apply to so many. But there's so much demand, there's so many people applying. And they've got all these skills, and they've got all these amazing grades, and they've got this amazing cover letter. They've put in a brilliant application, but they still get rejected. They still get turned away. See, that can really hurt them. Why? <coughs> what it does is rejection. It tells you that if there's something, or what a lot of people see it as, it's not necessarily this, it's not, necess not necessarily what rejection means, but a lot of people see it in this way. They see rejection as them being told they're not good enough. They see rejection in them being told you're not worthy of something, whatever it is you're going for. You're not worthy of it. In actual fact, it might simply mean that there was somebody else who had a better chance. Somebody else, somebody else who had a better skill set for that particular thing. It doesn't mean you're not good. Remember, just because somebody else is good, it doesn't mean you're not. Just because somebody else is better, it doesn't mean you're bad. No. But this has a massive effect on our what? Our self-esteem. And we spoke about our self-esteem in the past few days. Lectures on YouTube for those of you who wish to refer back to it. I won't go back to them too much because we're running out of time. Like I said, I wish to finish by 9.30, inshallah, as much as we can. See, this rejection affects our self-esteem, and we said our self-esteem has a massive impact on our loneliness, our isolation, our bonds with the people around us. This is our self-esteem coming into play again. Because of what? Because of rejection. Because of being turned away again and again. The fifth, I believe it is now, the fifth reason or cause for isolation that we look at today is abuse. <coughs> And abuse comes in different forms, many ways. Many people experience it in different manners, different levels of abuse, different ways of abuse, different forms of abuse. And the two main divides in abuse we look at are physical or verbal. We start off with physical abuse. Physical abuse, it can have massive impact on people. Ways that we don't realize. See, we think of physical abuse as being something Physical, it's in the name. But what we're looking at is psychological, it's mental. That's not physical, is it? But physical abuse can have a massive impact on somebody's psychology, on their thinking, on their mind. Why? How? Especially, and it's unfortunate, that a lot of the abuse that people suffer nowadays, it comes from people close to them. It comes from people they trust and people they care about. And unfortunately, what that means is trust is broken. We lose the ability to trust people. If I go to trust somebody, it could be my family, it could be a friend, it could be a partner. If I begin to trust them, what I do is I let my guard down around me. And like we said, for the majority of people living in the West, UK, Europe, America, we're very individualistic. We don't like letting our guard down. We don't like letting other people in. It's part of our psychology, the way we are. It's a little bit more difficult to open up to other people, <coughs> at least for a first time. So when we do that, when we let our guard down, we let ourselves be vulnerable in front of somebody because we really trust them. We have hope in them that they won't hurt us, that they won't do anything. Now focusing just on physical abuse, there's many different types. I won't say it wouldn't be appropriate to speak of them. But what that does is it breaks that trust. Those walls that were so difficult to break are very easy to put back up. But see, when you put them up, it's very difficult to break them again. It's very difficult to break them down again. I remember we were in South London and one of our centers there, SI Education Society, they had a, a, a small house just next to the center. And what happened was Squatters had taken over the house. Squatters are people who don't actually have a house, but if they find an empty house, they go there and they stay there. So the police were contacted, said, there's these random people living in the house that belongs to us. 
we don't know them, we don't know who they are, they just come and they started living there. They broke into a house and started living there. Now these squatters, they worked, they were doing it. The police told us that, unfortunately, uh, because of the way the law is, we can't actually go into the house. The police can't go into the house and take them out. We have to be in the house to invite the police in. We have to call the police inside the house, but we have to be inside the house ourselves. I wasn't actually present, my friends were there. What happened was they went, they decided, right, we need to get into the house one way or another. So first they tried to be sneaky. They tried to pretend they had a package to deliver. And then when the guys opened the door to take the package, we stormed the house. And the guys, they would storm the house, they'd rush in. But the guys inside, they were more clever, they were smarter. They realized they didn't open the door. So then we decided, right, the only way to get in is to push our way in, to force our way in. So we decided we're gonna break the door. The way the door was made, it was little panels. It was like squares. So one of my friends went, he gave it a massive kick. He kicked it, kicked it hard enough to break the panel. He breaks the panel and that little bit of the door falls in. Now I remember I said these guys, the squatters, they were builders. They immediately, they were ready for us. <laughs> they got that door back together before we could actually break any more of the door together. And when they fixed that door, it was so strong that we couldn't get in after that. We couldn't get through the door because they fixed it so well. They fixed it so strong, we couldn't get through after that. In the same way, when somebody lets down their walls, when they let down their guard, they start to trust you. When that wall is broken, they'll build that wall up again. They'll build it up fast. And they'll build it up so quickly, so strong, that you won't be able to get back through that wall. You won't be able to break that wall down again. And if you can, then it'll be very difficult. It'll take a lot more. But see, when we build walls around us, we isolate ourselves. We separate ourselves from the people around us. And when you go through that kind of abuse, when you feel like you can't trust people around you, then yes, loneliness makes sense. Loneliness comes about naturally. Why? Because when you can't trust the people around you, then how can you form a bond with them? How can you open up to them? How can you be normal around them again? It's physical abuse. The second type is verbal abuse. A lot of people compare the two, but it's one thing I don't know. We compare too many things too much. For instance, within our own communities, in Amaz and Azadari, we don't compare them. They're not comparable things. They're not two things opposite to each other that we compare, no. Wilaya and Risala, Imamat and Risala, they're not in opposition. They're not there to be compared, no. They go together. A lot of people, they like to compare physical and verbal abuse. They like to say that verbal abuse is worse. Some people want physical, physical abuse is worse, no. These are two types of abuse, both terrible types of abuse. Both disgusting types of abuse. Ones that we hope none of us ever have to go through, none of us ever have to struggle through. Verbal abuse more obviously has an effect on the psychology, on how we think, how we feel. I'll speed through this because, again, time's run short. We won't be able to finish by 9.30, but inshallah, we won't run too far over. Verbal abuse, they can come in many different ways. Me and my friends, we make fun of each other. One of my friends, he gets it more than the rest of us. He's like the victim of the group. Everybody makes fun of him. In fact, me and my friends, we all went to Morocco on holiday. And every night, I don't know how it happened, but every night, we all had separate rooms. It was a large group of us. There were a lot of us who went. We all had different rooms in the hotel. Every night, it just kind of so happened that we all gather in one room in the hotel. And I don't know how it happened, but somehow, every single night, we do the same thing. We'd make fun of everything that this one guy had done that day. Every little thing he did, we found a way to make fun of him for. Just as friends, just the way we do. And he has a phrase, he says it a lot. But sometimes, he just has to take it on the chin. Make fun of it, and somebody says to him, you know how you do when you're trying to cause a fight, or you're gonna have that, you're gonna take that from him. So oh, you gotta take it on the chin. What he means by that is, sometimes just a joke's a joke. You just take a joke. But sometimes those jokes hurt. Sometimes you don't like those jokes. And sometimes 
To me, I'm just telling a joke, but to you, it hurt. It hit something which we call an insecurity. Now, insecurities are possibly the most difficult thing that we deal with. Why? It's something that we find about ourselves which is not good enough. I know I've played 21 questions. We played it a lot. I know you guys play it a lot as well, I see. We played 21 questions. And the most difficult questions I've, question I've ever heard. Genuinely, you guys play 21 days. We play 20, 21 questions. <coughs> see, 21 questions, you have to tell the truth. You ask the question, you have to tell the truth. You have to ask the truth. And the most difficult question I've ever heard, and it came out of the blue, I still remember, we were on the bus, we were coming home from football, and this one guy, he got caught out, he lost. And without a moment's hesitation, one of our friends looks at him and he goes, I've got a question, he goes, what? He goes, what's your biggest insecurity? Now, if somebody asks you to speak about your insecurities, it's not easy, it's very difficult. And the one thing that you worry about, about yourself, the thing that you might think is not good enough about you, it's difficult to talk about it, it's difficult to think about it. And what verbal <coughs> abuse does is it attacks our insecurities. It attacks the things that we already think about ourselves, and if we don't, then it can create insecurities. It can make us feel insecure. And when we see everybody abusing us, even if it's as a joke, or if it's seriously, when we see that happening, we start to think, well, everyone's making fun of me. So who actually cares about me? These things that hurt me, when everybody's talking about them, or when somebody's targeting these things that hurt me, who actually cares about me? Who's taking care of me? And the thing with insecurities is we don't tell other people about our insecurities. So when somebody makes a joke about somebody else and it hurts them because of their insecurity, often, or when somebody says it knowingly, often the people around them won't know about it. Even the people they care about. They won't realize that it hurt that person. Why? Because they don't know that's an insecurity. They don't know that the, pe the person spends a lot of time worrying and thinking about that. This is how verbal abuse can affect us. When we look around and see that nobody realizes I'm hurting. Nobody realizes that I don't like this or that this is causing me problems and pain. This is abuse, physical, verbal. And there's different types within the physical, there's different types within. The verbal. The last one I'll mention, I won't spend any time dwelling on it, is an inability to fit in. And I've said it again and again during the course of this lecture. When you see somebody new come to Al-Fayyim, help them to fit in. Befriend them. Take care of them. Welcome them. For the adults, for the youngers. When you see somebody new come to school, help them fit in. It could be that you're new somewhere, so you struggle to fit in. It could be that you're still with the same friends that you always had. Still around the same people that you're always around. But because maybe you've grown, you've changed, your mindset's changed, your focuses have changed, you don't quite fit in with their thinking anymore. You don't quite fit in with their jokes anymore. You don't quite fit in with them anymore. Or it could be they've changed. You don't quite fit in with them anymore. For whatever various reasons. It's inability to fit in. And it can happen because of a, diff a lot of different reasons. This can also lead to isolation and loneliness. And I won't dwell on it because it's obvious when we don't fit in with those around us why we might feel lonely, why we might feel alone. Recite Salaam Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I finish this discussion quickly, inshallah, we'll continue it tomorrow. We'll finish it off tomorrow. Tonight, we remember the man known as Tamar ibn Hashim. The moon of the Minhaj. Tonight we remember the lion of the lion of Allah. Tonight we remember the baby brother of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We remember Abu Fadl Abbas, the Messiah, the tragedy of Hazrat Abbas. It was very painful. And because Hazrat Abbas was so important, so dear to so many people, so many people loved Abu Fadl Abbas so much. When we think about the Messiah of Hazrat Abbas, when I recite Messiah or any Shahid, Shaheed, I try to look at the relationships they had with other people. I try to focus on how they were with other people. When we looked at the Messiah of Hazrat Ana Muhammad, I looked at it from the point of view of their mother, Sayyidah Zainab. When we look 
at the Messiah of Hazrat, of Hazrat Basim. We looked at it from the point of view of Imam Hussain salam, who was losing the symbol of Imam Hassan, his older brother. Tonight, you remember Abu Fadl al the guardian of Sayyidah Zainab. The little brother of Imam Hussain salam, the uncle of Bibi Sakina, the son of Bibi Umul Bani, whose Messiah do we look at? Whose loss do we look at? How many angles can we look at the tragedy of Hazrat Abbas from? I'll try as best I can to cover the full Messiah of Hazrat Abbas from why it is so painful. I'll start off with the Umul Bani. See, the Umul Bani raised Hazrat Abbas according to some certain rules. She raised him in a certain way, especially with respect to the children of Imam Ali Salam, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Sayyidah Zainab Uliya Khatun, Ibn Umm Kulthum. Ibn Umm Bani, she had certain rules for Hazrat Abbas. The very first was Abbas. Just remember this. Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Umm Kulthum, they are the sons of Sayyidah Zahra. They are the sons of a queen. You, Abbas, you are the son of a maid. Ibn Umar Bani, she was the daughter of one of the great leaders of a very powerful tribe, but in front of the Ahlul Bayt, she made herself a maid. She made herself a servant of the Ahlul Bayt, albeit she was the wife of Imam Ali. She was a queen as well. But still, she told us of Abbas. Those are the children of Sayyidah Zahra. You are the son of Umm al -Bani. Those are the children of a princess, of a queen. You are the son of a maid, of a servant. Abbas, remember this. Treat them as you would treat your masters. The very first rule. And remember all these rules. They will come up again in the Messiah. I mentioned them for a reason. The very first rule is Abbas. When you speak to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, do not call them brother. Do not speak to them as they are your brother. Instead, when you speak to them, when you address them, call them Ya Sayyidi. Call them Ya Mawlai. Abbas. The second rule that Hazrat Abbas was taught to live by, he was told, never ask anything of your brothers. Never ask anything of your sisters. Abbas. Never ask a favor of Hassan or Hussein. Never ask Bibi Zainab or Bibi Umm to do anything for you, no. See, brothers, they ask each other for things. Sisters, they ask each other for things. Siblings, they ask each other for help, for favors. Bibi Umm al-Banin tells us about Abbas, Abbas, never ask your brothers or sisters for anything. Never ask Hassan or Hussein to bring you water. I mentioned water because when I was younger, my brother would always call me. He'd say, Zaki, bring me some water. He'd always tell me to bring water. It's one of the things that brothers do. It's one of the things that siblings do. One of the things you're told to do a lot. Get me some water. But when we talk of water, I would put a bath. It has a different thing. It is a different tragedy. The third rule that Bibi Umul Benin says to us about bath, she said, Abbas, Sayyidah Zainab and Umm Kultum are the daughters of Sayyidah Zahra. At no point should your eyes ever meet the eyes of Zainab and Umm Kulthum. At no point should you ever look into the eyes of Zainab and Umm Kulthum. But oh, I have not yet started the Messiah of Abul Abbas, but I know what I have to say. I know what I have prepared. I will try my best to recite this Messiah. But oh, Khudah, I have not yet started saying the Messiah, but I can already feel my heart breaking. I can already feel the pain of Hazrat Abbas's Messiah. Hazrat Abbas is given these three rules for your whole life. Refer to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein as your Sayyidi. Refer to them as your Mawlai. Do not call them brother. What else? He is told never ask anything. Never ask a favor or a request from your brothers or from your sisters. And the third, never look into the eyes of Sayyidah. <laughs> the time comes when Imam Ali is leaving the world. According to one narration, 
he calls together all his children. He calls Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan alayhi salam forwards. He takes the hand of Imam Hassan. <coughs> one by one, he calls all his other children and he places their hands in the hand of Imam Hassan. He says to them, look, from now on, Hassan is your Imam. From now on, Hassan will take care of you. From now on, you, t- you will look after Hassan. You will protect Hassan. He is your Mawla. He is your master. He takes the hands of each of his children and places them in the hands of Imam Hassan, except for the hand of Abu al Abbas. <laughs> the Rupal Baneen sees this and she asks Mawla Ali, she asks Mawla, is it because these are the children of Zahra and Abbas, the son of Umm al-Baneen, that you did not give his hand in the hand of Imam Hassan? Imam Ali says, no, Umm al-Baneen, it is not like this. He then calls forward Imam Hussein, he calls forward Abu al Abbas, he takes the hand of Abu Abbas. Places it in the hand of Imam Hussein. He says, Abbas, Hussein is your master. You must protect Hussein at all costs. Wherever you go, take care of my darling Hussein. As Abu al Abbas, he takes Imam's words. He keeps them with him. He never forgets what his father has told him. There comes a day while they are still young, while they are still children, where Imam Hussein salam, says to Abu al Abbas, he says, Abbas, Will you bring me some water? Hazrat Abbas, he goes quickly, he brings the water to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When he brings the water, Imam Hussein starts weeping and crying. He starts wailing. Hazrat Abbas becomes worried. He says, Mawla, have I done something wrong? Is the water too cold? Is the water warm? Did I take too long? What is the matter? Why do you cry? Mawla Hussein says, Abbas. He said, Abbas, I'm crying because when I asked for water, you came to me so quickly, but Abbas, one day I will be calling out, is there anyone to help me? And Abbas, you will not come to my aid. Abbas, you will not be able to help me then. As Abu al Abbas, he's still young, he's still a child, he thinks maybe I will be asleep. Maybe Imam Hussein will call me and I will be asleep. So Hazrat Abbas, from then on, he stopped sleeping. One day goes by, Hazrat Abbas did not sleep at night. The second day goes by, Hazrat Abbas did not sleep at night. They say the third day, at some point, the Umm Kulthum saw the eyes of Hazrat Abbas, bloodshot red. She goes to Hazrat Abbas, she said, Abbas, what has happened? What is, why are your eyes red? She thinks he has been crying. She then takes Hazrat Abbas to Mimi Zainab. She says, Sister Zainab, maybe Hussein has said something to Abbas that Abbas's eyes have gone red. That has made Abbas cry so much that he has made himself in this state, put himself in this state. As Abu al-Fadl Abbas is looking down, he remembers his mother's words, never meet the eyes of Zainab and Umm Never look Zainab and Umm Kulthum in the eyes. As Abbas is looking down, Sayyidah Zainab could not see what Sayyidah Bibi Umm Kulthum saw. She could not see the bloodshot eyes of Hazrat Abu al-Fadl Abbas. She looks at him and she says, Abbas, look my way one moment. Let me see your face. As Abu al-Fadl Abbas remains looking down, he keeps his gaze lowered. Sayyidah Zainab says again, Abbas, let me see your face, let me see your eyes. The Umm al is standing there. At this point, Bibi Zainab says, Abbas, I am ordering you look towards me. Let me see your eyes. And Abbas looks towards Bibi Umm al On the one hand, his mother's rule, never look into the eyes of Sayyid Zainab and Umm Kulthum. On the other hand, the order of Sayyid Zainab, Abbas, look into my eyes. The Umm al she says, Abbas, listen to your... Listen to your master. Listen to your mistress. Abbas, listen to Sayyid Zainab. As the Abbas, he looks up at the eyes of Sayyid Zainab. She sees his eyes are bloodshot red. They look as though he has been crying. She takes him to Imam Hussein. She says to her brother Hussein, Hussein, what is it you have, you have said to Abbas? What is it that you have said that has made him cry and has made him put himself into this state? Imam Ali and Imam Hussein, lay salam, he understands. He understands what has happened. He says, Abbas? Abbas, the day I was talking about will not be today or tomorrow. It will be 61 Hijri. It will not be Medina, it will be Karbala. We will be on the burning sands. I will be looking out around me for a helper. But Abbas, you will be by the river Fara. As I call out, You will be pleading with Malakul Maut. You will say, give me just one more chance to go and help my master. Just one more chance to go and help my Hussein. It has been narrated, it has been narrated that on the day of Ashura in Medina, when the cry was heard coming from Masjid al-Nabawi, that Imam Hussein had been killed in Karbala, Bibi Umm al it's said that at this point her eyesight was either very weak or she had gone blind. 
She says to her Abbas, his son, take me to Masjid al-Nabawi. She wears her hijab. She goes to Masjid al-Nabawi with her grandson. There, the man who had announced, the man who had sold the people of Medina, <coughs> Imam Hussein has been killed. The Umm al addresses him, she says to him. She says to him, I heard you were saying that Hussein has been killed in Karbala. <laughs> He says it is true in Karbala, Hussein has been martyred, he has been slaughtered. Bibi Umul Banin says, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe that while my Abbas is alive, Hussein has been hurt. He says, no, Abbas was not alive. She says, how? He says, before Hussein was killed, Abbas was killed. She says, no, maybe you do not know the Abbas I am talking about. The Abbas I am talking about could fight armies upon armies. He could fight legions upon legions. How could Abbas have been killed? Then the man who announced it, he says to her, what happened was a man struck Abu al Abbas from behind with his sword. As it hit his head, Abbas falls from his horse to the ground. The Umar Banin says, no, you definitely are not talking about my Abbas. It's not possible that somebody goes to strike my Abbas and my Abbas cannot stop the strike. My Abbas is very strong. He's very powerful. If somebody goes to hit him, Abbas can stop the strike. The man says his Abbas would have stopped the strike. He would have stopped the man who tried to hit him, but what could he do? Abbas had no hands at the time. <laughs> she then looks at him. She begins crying and she begins weeping. The man asks, I had already told you that your Abbas has been killed. I had already said that Hussein has been killed. Why is it now that you begin crying? Why is it now that you have started crying? She looks at him and she says, From your words a thought came into my mind. You said when he was struck on the back of his head, he fell from his horse. But you also told me his hands had been cut off. When somebody falls, what do they do? They put their arms out in front of him. As a boss fell from the height of his horse to the ground, tell me did he land with his face first or with his chest? The man replies, first what went hit what hit the ground was his chest which was filled with arrows. A boss landed on the arrows in his chest. This is the Messiah will be Umul Banin. This is the Messiah will be Umul Banin. I'll take you back, back one night to Shabir Ashur. Shabir Ashur, the ninth of Muharram, Hazrat Abbas. He knows a battle is to come. He is a commander. He fought in Sifin. When he fights in Sifin, what did the enemy <coughs> say? They said it is the high. He is in the battlefield. Hazrat Abbas is a warrior. Hazrat Abbas is sitting according to one narration. Hazrat Abbas sits with Hazrat Ali Akbar. He says to him, Akbar, tomorrow, when the battle starts, I have been watching the armies of Yazid. They have been split into four sections. Akbar, you go with the boys, attack one section. I will go and attack one section. We will leave the companions of Imam Hussein to attack the other two sections. Akbar, I will quickly defeat my army. Then I will come and help you and the boys. The companions will fight their battle. Together we will defeat the army of Yazid. But what was Abbas to know? He says this to Hazrat Ali Akbar. Afterwards, one of the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he comes to Hazrat Abbas. He says to him, Abbas, I have heard that in Tahajjud, Mawla Ali, he asked for you, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, give me a son who will be able to protect my Hussein when the day of Ashura comes in the battle of Karbala. Hazrat Abbas, he looks at him and he says, he looks at the companion of Imam Hussein and he says, he said, just wait till tomorrow. You will see how I will protect my master. You will see how I will fight my battle for Mawla Hussein. But what was Abbas to know? Companions came and they went. His companions left for battlefield. Bodies were brought back. He came to Imam Hussein. He said to Mawla Hussein, Mawla, give me permission. Let me go and fight. Mawla Hussein again and again. He said the same thing. He says, Abbas, you are the leader of my army. Abbas, you are the commander of my army. I cannot let you go to the battlefield yet. Your soul, your fight will come. Abbas, your shahadas will come. I cannot let you go to the battlefield yet. One by one, the companions of Imam Hussein go. Then the family of Imam Hussein starts to go. At one point, in Hazrat Abbas, he comes to Imam Hussein. He says to him, Allah. He says, give me permission now to go and fight my battle. Mawla Hussein looks at him, he says, Abbas, 
You are the commander of my army. He said it again and again. Hazrat Abbas has heard it again and again, but what does he say this time? This time, Hazrat Abbas looks at Mawla Hussein, he says, Mawla, look at the camps now. What army is left for me to command? Who is left for me to command, oh, Mawla? Imam Hussein says, no, Abbas, no. I cannot let you go to battle yet. And there comes a time on the day of Ashura. There comes a moment in the day of Ashura. Well, Hazrat Abbas from the camps, he hears the children crying, Alatash, Alatash. He hears them crying from the thirst. Hazrat Abbas, he goes into the tent where the children are there. What does he see? He sees the children surround Bibi Sakina. They say to her, Sakina, your uncle Abbas never ever says no to you. Ask your uncle Abbas to bring us some water. Bibi Sakina comes to Hazrat Abbas. Behind her are all the children. She says to Hazrat Abbas, Oh, Uncle Abbas, I wish to ask you for one thing. Will you at least get us children some water? Hazrat Abbas looks at Bibi Sakina and he says, Sakina, I will do this for you, but first I need you to do something for me. Bibi Sakina looks out towards the battlefield. She looks up at her uncle. She says, Uncle Abbas, here in the desert of Karbala, what is there that I can do for you? What is there that I can do that will help you? Hazrat Abbas says, Sakina, come with me to your father. Come with me to your father and you ask your father to send me to get some water. Ask him to send me to the Quran. Maybe Sakina, she goes with Abul Fazl Abbas into the tent of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. She says to Imam Hussein, she says to her father, she says, I'm not asking for myself, but the children have asked me to ask my uncle Abbas. If you give my uncle Abbas permission just to go and get some water, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he hears Sakina's request. He looks towards the ground, tears fill his eyes. He looks back at Sakina and he says, Sakina, do not ask this. Ask anything from me, but I promise you, if you ask this, you will regret it. Sakina says, Father, I am not asking for myself. I ask for the children who are still thirsty. Bibi Sakina gets the permission. Hazrat Abbas is given permission. Mawla Hussein alayhi salam, he says to Abbas, Abbas, you are not going to fight a battle. Abbas, you are not going to fight the soldiers of Yazid. Abbas, you are simply going to get water for the children. Hazrat Abbas says to his Mawla, he says to Imam Hussein, okay, I will not fight. I will not attack the soldiers. I will just go get the water and come back. Imam Hussein, as Hazrat Abbas is leaving the tent, he stops him. He says, Abbas, Hand over your sword to me. Abbas, give me your sword. Here, take this broken spear. As Abbas has a broken spear, he takes it with him. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, according to one narration, just before Hazrat Abbas leaves, he stops him one more time. He stops him one more time and he says, Abbas, before you leave for the battlefield, before you go towards the battlefield, do one thing. Go and bid farewell to Sayyid Azayna. <laughs> Go and bid farewell to your sister. And the Abbas goes, he stands outside the tent of Sayyid Azayna. He calls out to her, he says to his sister, he says to his mistress, he says, Sayyid Azayna, I wish to bid farewell. I am going now to get water for the children. Sayyid Azayna. Sayyid Azayna then addresses Hazrat Abbas. She said, Abbas, there came a time when we first moved into Kufa. My father Ali said to me, Zainab, Zainab, look at these streets. Today you are welcomed as a princess, but today you will come. Where in these very streets you will be paraded as a prisoner. In these very streets people will throw rocks and stones at you. As we were growing up, I used to think to myself, how can this possibly happen? How will this ever happen to me when my Abbas will take care of me? When I have Abul Fadl Abbas to protect me. Abbas, now that you are going to the battlefield, I can see the time is near. I will be made a prisoner. Rocks and stones will be pelted at me. These ain't a bit so well to Abul Fadl Abbas. He starts to ride out towards the battlefield. A line of archers stands in front of him. They are ready for Hazrat Abbas to come. 
But as they see the Lion of Ali descend into the battlefield, as they see him move towards the Quran, they become afraid. They all scatter. They begin to run away. As Abbas, he rides all the way to the river Farad. He rides to the river Farad and his horse stands next to him. He gets off his horse, he takes the mush, the water bottle of Bibi Sakina. He fills it up with water. He takes water in one hand. He looks at the water, but what can he do? Sakina and Asghara are still thirsty. He takes the water, throws it back into the Quran. He turns around, he mounts his horse. He looks at his horse as if to say to his horse to drink some water. The horse is not a soldier. The horse has no reason to be thirsty, but the horse refuses to drink. The Imam Hazrat Abbas's horse does not drink water. He turns around, he starts riding towards Imam Hussein. At this point, from the armies of Yazid, a cry is heard. Do not let any water reach the camps of Hussein or our armies will be destroyed today. At this point, all the arrows and the spears start to fire towards Hazrat Abbas. Hazrat Abbas, he says to his horse, he says, go quickly. He rides as fast as he can. Hazrat Abbas riding as fast as he can go towards the camps of Imam Hussein. He sees at one point somebody strikes him with one, from, on one arm. His right arm falls. He takes the mush into his teeth. He takes the alam into his left hand. I'll narrate to you now the point of view of Bibi Sakina. From here, let me tell you the story of Bibi Sakina. Bibi Sakina is only little. When she looks out into the battlefield, she cannot see what is going on. She is standing at the entrance to the tent with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They watch as the Allah moves away from them. Bibi Sakina cannot see Hazrat Abbas. She can only see the Allah in the sky. The Allah is moving away from them, further and further away. At one point, the Allah drops. Bibi Sakina looks up at Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein smiles. He looks back at Bibi Sakina. He says, Sakina, your uncle Abbas has reached the river Farad. The Alam has dropped because he is bending down to fill your mush. She then sees the Alam rise again. She then sees it turn around, start to ride towards her, start to come closer and closer. At one point, she sees the Alam drop again. She looks towards Mawla Hussein. She looks for a smile or some consolation. But Mawla Hussein, he turns his face away from Sakina. He looks away from Sakina. <laughs> what is happening in the battlefield? Hazrat Abbas has lost one arm. The Alam, he has taken it into one hand. He has taken the mask into another. And now, he has lost another arm. Somebody has struck Hazrat Abbas's left arm. Hazrat Abbas, somehow, he takes the Alam. He holds it up. As Hazrat Abbas is riding at full pace, Towards the camps of Imam Hussein, one arrow comes and it hits the mushk of Sakina. It hits the mushk of Sakina. The water starts to flow from the mushk onto the sands of Karbala. As the Abbas, riding full pace towards the camp at one point, immediately comes to a stop. In the middle of the arrows and the spears, as the Abbas stands looking at this mushk, the water on the floor. <laughs> They say at this point, Hazrat Abbas, he takes his horse, he turns away from the camps of Imam Hussein, he turns his directions towards the army of Yazid, and slowly starts riding towards them. He cries out, I came to get water, I promised Sakina water. If I could not bring her water, then I could not go back to the tent. At this point, the armies of Yazid attack. Abbas has no arms to defend himself with. They say one arrow. One arrow was fired. It hits us of Abbas in the eye. They say... <laughs> there was an arm. He went to a majlis of Hazrat Abbas. The Zakir, he recites this very point, this very moment, when he recites that the arrow hits the eye of Hazrat Abbas. This Zakir faint, this Arlin faints. He faints and then after, when he comes back into consciousness, he says to the speaker, he says to the Zakir, he says, never recite that Messiah again, I felt myself almost die in that moment. He says, do not recite that Messiah again. He says, that night, he went to the grave of Hazrat Abbas. He says he falls asleep at the grave and in, the, in his dream, he sees Hazrat Abbas. He speaks to him. He says to Hazrat Abbas, Ya Abul Fal, forgive me today I stopped the Zakir from reciting your Messiah. 
It was too much for me to handle. I told him not to recite that again. Hazrat Abbas, according to this alim, he writes it after he passes away. He writes that Hazrat Abbas said to me, he said to me, why did you stop him? He had not even understood what my Messiah was in that point. He says, whenever anybody was struck with an arrow, what did they do? With their hands, they would pull the arrow out of their body. He says, I wish to pull the arrow out of my eye. But I did not have any hands with which to pull. He says, I looked towards my horse. I clenched the arrow between my two knees. I pulled my head back. He says, blood filled my face. He says, <laughs> just a few more lines of my side. Stay with me, just a few more lines. Hazrat Abbas, at one point, he struck on the head. He falls from the Zuljana, he falls from his horse to the sands of Karbala. As he is falling, as he is falling, he calls out to Imam Hussein, what does he say? He calls out, Adrikni, Adrikni, Sayyidi, Amana. He remembers what Umul Barin said. Never call Hassan Hussein, brother. They are your Mawla, they are your Aqa, they are your lords, your masters. He calls out to his master as he falls to the ground. Imam Hussein at this point calls out those famous words. <coughs> at this point, Imam Hussein looks to the heavens and he calls out, Now my back is broken. <laughs> he rides out to the battlefield. He finds Abul Fadl Abbas. If you can listen to this, if you can listen to this, he says, he sits down next to Abul Fadl Abbas. He takes the head of Abul Abbas and he puts it on his chest. He says at this point, Hazrat Abbas, he pushes himself up, puts his head back on the ground. He says again, Imam Hussein pulls Hazrat Abbas into his lap. Again, Hazrat Abbas pulls himself onto the ground. Imam Hussein says, Abbas, let me take you in my lap. What does Hazrat Abbas say? He says, Mawla, it is not long now. Your head will be on the sands of Karbala. Your body will be on the sands of Karbala. There will be nobody to take you in their lap. Mawla Hussein looks at him. He said, Abbas, do not worry. At that time, from the Qiyya, my mother Zahra will come. My mother Zahra will take me in her lap. Listen to this final conversation. This final conversation, and then I will finish the Messiah. The last conversation between Hazrat Abbas and Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein. He looks at Hazrat Abbas. Hazrat Abbas looks back at Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein says to him, Abbas, Abbas, make a wasiya. Abbas, tell me your dying wish. Hazrat Abbas, he looks at Imam Hussein, he says, Mawla. He says, Mawla, do not take my body back into the tent. I do not wish for Sakina to see me. He then says to him, This is his master. This is his Mawla. Hazrat Abbas says to Imam Hussein, Mawla, forgive me. There is nothing else I could do for you now. There is no way I can help you now. Imam Hussein looks at Abbas. He says, no, Abbas, there is one thing I wish of you. One last request I have for you. That's what Abbas looks at him. He says, Mawla, what is there left that I can do? I have no hands with which I may help you. I cannot get up from my position. How can I help you? Oh, he looks at the boss. He looks at the boss and he says, "A boss, since we were children, <laughs> he says, since we were children, you have always called me Mauna. Once in your life, a boss, call me brother. <laughs> call me your brother, a boss. Under the boss." He looks towards Mawla Hussein, or rather, he moves his face towards Mawla Hussein. He says, my brother. <laughs> he says, my brother, when I first came into this world, <laughs> when I first came into this world, the first face I saw was yours. As I leave this world, I wish to see your face one more time. Mawla Hussein, he says to him, Abbas, Abbas, I am right in front of you. Why can you not see my face? 
Oh, boss, why do you say you wish to see me one more time? He says to Mona, Hussein, he says, Mona. He says, brother, one last time. He calls his brother, Hussein, my brother. He says, my brother, <laughs> one eye has been injured from the arrow. The other is covered in blood. I cannot see anything. Mona Hussein, he wipes the eyes of Hazrat Abbas. He wipes the blood of Hazrat Abbas. Hazrat Abbas looks at his master. His master looks at him. Hazrat Abbas leaves this world in the lap of Mona Hussein. Allah, 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 to accept this small ibadah of ours and grant us the ajr of a great ibadah and grant us a great reward. We ask Allah Azawajal around the world for all those mu'mineen, mu'minat, muslimin, muslimat who are struggling. O Allah, ease their pains and their struggles. We ask Allah Azawajal to hasten the, re the reappearance of the Imam of our time. Muhammad Muhammad